Last week, we started to overturn that firmly established myth that the church has been an enemy of science. Today, we're going to bury that myth once and for all. So join me for the Catholic Church, Builder of Civilization. Welcome to the Catholic Church, Builder of Civilization. I'm Dr. Thomas Woods. Last time, we engaged in some myth-busting. We looked at things everybody knows. The church is an enemy of science, right? Everybody knows that. We're all taught that in school. What we started to see was that modern professors who actually do this for a living are starting to say something like the opposite. They're starting to say, we need to be fair to the Catholic Church and give her her due in the development of science in the Western world. And some have gone so far as to ask the truly forbidden question, is the development of science in Western civilization something that may have occurred because of the Catholic Church rather than in spite of it, as we're so often told? Last time we placed particular emphasis on a central teaching that modern science takes for granted, namely that the world we live in makes sense you can understand it. You can expect to find patterns in it if you investigate it. You can expect to find mathematical relationships if you investigate it. In fact, you can hope to reduce the phenomena of nature to some kind of mathematical formula so as to understand it better and predict it better. Well, where did this crazy idea come from? It came right out of the Bible with Wisdom 1121 that tells us that God has ordered all things according to measure, number, and weight. And we saw that the early church fathers, the cathedral school at Chartres, and others besides took this to mean the universe makes sense, so let's go find out about it. Let's go study it. Let's go use the scientific method. Gather data, formulate hypotheses, and then test those hypotheses. You can't do any of these things unless you already believe the universe makes sense and is orderly and follows consistent laws. And that idea, that idea, comes from the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church insists that God is a God of order, and he's a God who has built patterns into our universe that we can discover using our minds. Science is impossible without this fundamental insight, and I gave examples last time of civilizations who, lacking that insight, also lacked science. This time, we're going to talk a little bit more about specifics. We're going to name names today. We're going to look at specific people who were Catholics who pioneered in the sciences. And specifically, we're even going to look at people who invented things and who made discoveries that we take for granted today, but that are typically forgotten or left out of the standard textbook treatment. So for instance, I don't think it's particularly well known that 35 craters on the moon are named after Jesuit scientists and mathematicians. I also don't think it's particularly well known that when you look at the history of mathematics, a great many of the greatest mathematicians who ever lived were Jesuits. People don't realize that. Is that taught in school? Not usually. But it's very interesting that in the early 19th century, when an early historian of mathematics set about chronicling the 300 or so greatest mathematicians of the previous 27 centuries, so going back to 900 BC and then going to his day about 1800 AD, those 27 centuries, he found that of the 300, about 5% were Jesuits. Now, consider how significant that is. The Jesuits were around for only two, a little over two of those 27 centuries. Because the Jesuits, remember, were founded in 1540, and then they were suppressed briefly in the 1770s, so a little over two centuries, and yet still, in an impartial compilation of the greatest mathematicians of all time, it turns out that one out of every 20 belongs to this single order of Catholic priests. Well, again, rather significant, is it not? 
But we'll leave even the Jesuit accomplishments uh, to the side now. Let's mention Roger Bacon, a great 13th century figure. Roger Bacon was a Franciscan who taught at Oxford and who's been considered a forerunner of the scientific revolution. Roger Bacon emphasized the importance of experimentation and observation. These are the key aspects of modern science, that we don't simply rely on what other people have said. Well, Aristotle was really smart, so we'll just sort of more or less go with him. We have to verify scientific conclusions on the basis of either our own observations or on the basis of experiments by people who are carrying them out according to the sound principles of scientific method. Now, Roger Bacon consistently emphasized this, and he said, without experiment, nothing can be adequately known. An argument proves theoretically, but does not give the certitude necessary to remove all doubt. Nor will the mind repose in the clear view of truth unless it finds it by way of experiment. Well, there is a scientific turn of mind right there with, with Roger Bacon in the 13th century at Oxford. Among other things, Roger Bacon identified the following as obstacles to the transmission of truth, uninstructed popular opinion, and long-standing but erroneous custom. Well, all of these, uh, both of these things, I think, the church is usually accused of, of encouraging. Well, you're just going along with what people say, or you're trying to form what they think. You're trying to get them to believe crazy superstition. But in fact, to the contrary, Roger Bacon is saying these are the things we have to try to avoid. We have to use experimentation and our own observation, because maybe what people believe is untrue. We need to verify things using experiment. Or St. Albert the Great, who taught at the University of Paris, one of his students was St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Albert, according to the Dictionary of Scientific Biography, was proficient in all branches of science. He was one of the most famous precursors of modern science in the high Middle Ages. That's why in 1941, Pope Pius XII named him the patron of all who cultivate the natural sciences. And well, he should. In fact, he was so prolific his output spanned so many disciplines that even people who despise the church continue to admire Albert the Great, Albertus Magnus. The aim of natural science, he said, was not simply to accept the statements of others, that is, what is narrated by people, but to investigate the causes that are at work in nature for ourselves. Well, there you go. Now, let's get down to some brass tacks here, though. Let's move further uh, toward the present, and consider some long-forgotten names. For example, Father Nicholas Stino was, in fact, considered to be the father of stratigraphy, which is, in fact, the, the study of the layers of the Earth's surface. And geologists need to know uh, Stino's principles. He later became a Catholic priest. In the late 1980s, he was beatified by Pope John Paul II, who praised him for his sanctity and his science. I'd like to focus specifically, though, on the Jesuits, because they, I think, have been criticized like no other religious group in the Catholic world over the centuries. Uh, they've been thrown out of countries, they've been banned, they've been suppressed, they've been imprisoned, they've been killed. It's unbelievable the calumny against the Jesuits. And yet, and here I'm quoting an expert on the Jesuits who has no axe to grind in this one way or the other. The Jesuits by the 18th century had contributed to the development of pendulum clocks, pantographs, barometers, reflecting telescopes and microscopes, to scientific fields as various as magnetism, optics, and electricity. They observed, in some cases before anyone else, the colored bands on Jupiter's surface, the Andromeda Nebula, and Saturn's rings. They theorized about the circulation of the blood independently of Harvey, the theoretical possibility of flight the way the moon affected the tides, and the wave-like nature of light. Star maps of the southern hemisphere, symbolic logic, flood control measures, introducing plus and minus signs into Italian mathematics, all were typical Jesuit achievements. Now, I'm sorry to sound like a broken record, but how often are students taught this in school? Never. It's not like they're taught it a little, or once in a while they hear about this. They never hear it. 
They never hear it. I've never seen a Western civilization textbook that takes note of this phenomenon. Not one. And believe me, over many an anguished night when I was a professor in New York, I would search through Western Civ textbooks, one after the other. Which one of these can I assign in good conscience? And it was hard to find any. So what I wound up having to do, in case you're wondering, is assign a not-so-good textbook, but then also assign my own How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization. And I took some comfort in knowing that, okay, maybe the students won't read my book, but they probably, these are the same students who won't read the textbook either. And so one encouraging thing about the fact that we live in a world in which students don't read is that they won't be reading the propaganda either. And so it'll be easier for me to de-brainwash them because they won't be reading anything. <laughs> they won't be reading anything to contradict that. They'll actually finally get to hear the truth for a change unmediated. But consider now some more specific examples of Jesuits and their achievements. We have only a minute before we have the break, but let's consider Father Giambattista Riccioli was the first person to calculate how fast a freely falling body accelerates to the ground. Surprising, isn't it? Father Francesco Grimaldi first discovered and named the phenomenon of the diffraction of light. Now, Father Francesco Grimaldi, you may be thinking about pasta sauce, but that, that's Francesco Rinaldi, and I'm sure Francesco Grimaldi would be appalled at that sauce. But what's interesting about the two of them is that they, they work together to produce a selenograph, which is a detailed description, or a, uh, pardon me, a, de a detailed map, in effect, of the surface of the moon, depicting all the various aspects of it. And their selenograph adorns the entrance to this day to the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. These were not stupid idiots. Now, there are still other scientists we have to cover, and we'll be getting to them a little bit after the break. But for now, let's just note that it isn't just that we've got a bunch of scattered scientists here and there. It's that in practically every scientific discipline, there are priests who are involved, not just Catholic laymen, but priests who have who occupy this most important vocation in the church. So join me in a minute. Let's keep doing some myth-busting. <laughs> 